Thank you for the introduction. It's a, it's a bit unnerving to be sitting here in front of my dad. We've usually been on opposite sides when I'm doing this. Um, I'm one of the five founders of, I just, so the way I've structured is I'll, I'll spend about 10 minutes talking about what it is that we do as a company. Um, spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about why we got into this space and sort of how we got into this space. And maybe 10 minutes on a couple of things we learned along the way. And then sort of, it'll be useful if you guys can just shoot questions at me. So I'm one of the five founders of Delivery. We're a five-year-old uh, business. So fundamentally what Delivery does is we provide infrastructure and services and technology to businesses which are going online. We have three fundamental sets of customers. They are e-commerce retailers, so Flipkart, Amazon, Snapdeal, Paytm, eBay, the whole gang. Um, we then sell our services to small and medium businesses who list and sell through these platforms. So you would have noticed when you go onto Flipkart or you go onto Amazon, there's a, there's a merchant name over there. Right? So those merchants are direct customers of delivery as well. And the third set of customers are enterprises or brands. So if you were to go to, uh, if you were to, go to the Tata Click website and buy something from them, or you went to Titan or Fast Track, we would be the ones delivering either from their warehouses or their stores. So we have three fundamental groups of customers that we service. What we provide to them is, first of all, the physical infrastructure for logistics, which is warehousing and transportation. So we do what we call fulfillment services, which is where these companies store their inventory with us across about 13 warehouses in the country. And we provide the storage, pick, pack, and ship operation for them. And then we run the largest transportation network of our kind across the country. So we deliver to about 6,800 odd pin codes, which is translates to about 530 cities across the country. It's a completely self-owned and self-operated network. And we deliver on their behalf to the consumer. Along with this, obviously, what we do is also provide reverse logistics, payment services, um, packaging material to their suppliers, dropship, warehousing. That's the whole sort of gamut of the services that we provide. And uh, we service today close to about 2,500 e-commerce companies, about 150,000 merchants, and about 100 brands. Right? That's one part of the service. The second important part of the service that we built over the last five years was to build the entire backend technology stack. So when you actually go online, a whole bunch of stuff happens after you click the checkout button on the website. We have to figure out where the item is going to come from, which seller is going to sell it, what's the shortest path from there to you. Is it a COD shipment or a prepaid shipment? If it's a COD shipment, how much cash do we collect from you? How do we move that cash back to the seller? All of those systems are essentially a self-created platform to the backend, which we then open out to our customers. So essentially, they have access to our warehouse management systems, they have access to our transport management systems, they have access to our return systems, our payment systems, all of which combine and integrate deeply into their front ends or into their order management. Right? And these are completely, essentially self-built, completely flexible and customizable. We provide this technology to our clients as well. So in essence, that's what delivery does. The simplest way for you to think about it in terms of comparables, so the way we think about the business is, uh, are you guys familiar with Amazon Web Services, AWS? Uh, it's the big cash cow in the Amazon portfolio. Fundamentally, the way AWS works is uh, there are two core services, which are called storage and compute. Storage is basically where they store all of the data. Compute is basically something which is elastic search, which allows you to run specific computations on the data that you have. And then if you're a business, they sell you a whole bunch of other value-added services, right? So they'll send you data, they'll sell you database services, they'll sell you Firebase, which are all web services. In that sense, the way we think of delivery is that our warehousing arm is really storage. Our transportation arm is really compute. And then to our customers, we sell a whole bunch of value-added services on top of this, which we've built over the last five years, which include things like less than truckload shipping, international shipping, both out of India and into India, inventory management services, reverse logistics, right? So that's, that's pretty much how we've grown um, as a company. So that is what we do um, in terms of how we got here. So the five of us had no background when we started the company, had absolutely no background in B2B businesses or in logistics or in e-commerce or in technology or frankly in anything which is remotely connected to what we do today. When we quit, uh, I come from a background in consulting, so I went to IM Bangalore, quit, 
joined a company called uh, Bain and Company. Spent about two and a half years consulting for them in uh, London, Delhi, and Bombay, and did a lot of work on the telecom side, but absolutely nothing um, in this in this sector. Three of us come from a background at Bain, and then we had two other founders who came and joined us. What we started out with was a very simple premise. When we quit um, Bain and the five of us got together, we went to every e-commerce company in the land. And we said, listen, there's a lot of, by, a, a small company by then had actually started making news. It was called Flipkart. This was in 2009. They were doing 500 orders a day, and people were buying books from, uh, from them. So we called up the founders of Flipkart, and we said, hey, look, you know, uh, you guys just raised some capital at that point from Axel Partners. What's this all about? And uh, spent time talking to them, and then a whole bunch of other, there were a whole bunch of other companies. I don't know if you remember these names, Fashion and You, Urban Touch. Um, health card, all of them came back and said, look, our biggest problem is as a B2C company, we essentially are outsourcing our consumer experience to the logistics partner, who at that point was Aramex and Blue Dart. Blue Dart is DHL in India, and Aramex is a fairly large Middle Eastern company here. And they're terrible at what they do. When we ship a box to them, it takes them you know, three to five days to get to the consumer. We don't get our cash back in time. We have no idea where the box is, and uh, this is a huge problem. So perhaps out of, out of some degree of overconfidence at the time, we said this sounds like a problem that we can solve very easily. Um, let's go out and start a, a logistics company. And the idea with as to why we started was we had two things. One is we said that this is a service that is common to everybody in the space. Right? If you're a B2B player in this space, we have two options. One is go B2C, which is to actually go and start an e-commerce company ourselves. The other was to say, build something that's common to every B2C business in the land. And we said that actually is more exciting than going and trying to become one more e-commerce company. B, we actually spent a lot of time with our competitors when we started out. Um, one of the questions they wanted me co to cover was, how do you build partnerships in this space? The interesting thing we discovered was that our first set of partners were our customers and our competitors. Um, our customers, because they actually helped us, they expressed a need which we were able to co-develop a solution for with them. And our competitors, because they actually helped us figure out how to grow our business in the first place. So we went to Blue Dart and we said, hey, we want to start a business in transportation. Contrary to laughing us out of the room, they actually opened up all of their systems and they said, you're welcome to visit all our hubs, you're welcome to visit all our DCs. And we went and looked at them. And we realized at that point that existing players in India were simply unaware of what was coming their way through e-commerce. Simply put, here are a couple of reasons why. If you've ever gone to a courier store in India, you'll discover that they still give you a handwritten waybill, right? Which means chances are, by the time you get back to, to your home or wherever it is, um, your product actually hasn't moved and it's been eight to 10 hours. Because the time it takes them for to them to manually type in the information by which time some guy realizes that your product is there is way too long. If you ever bought things online, you realize that that's not how consumers behave, though. The second somebody makes a purchase online, the next thing that person does is to go and see, when am I going to receive this product? Right? And they actually expect both the e-commerce company as well as the fulfillment partner, which is a delivery or whoever else, to have real-time information on this. None of these companies was equipped to provide real-time information at all. They were still operating off of manual old systems which they had built in you know, the late 90s without understanding that they now had the tools to go real-time. That was problem one, which was a technology problem. Problem two was they simply failed to recognize the value of cash in the economy. Logistics companies never deal with cash in general until the e-commerce boom started. All of them dealt in prepaid systems, right? You go and you give them a letter or a document or an ATM card or a checkbook. The this was the first time that someone was saying, I want you to take my products one way and bring my cash back the other. So what the logistics companies really missed was that while one part of their business was transportation or warehousing, there was another part which was actually a payment gateway, a giant offline payment gateway, which over time would have to transact billions of dollars of cash annually with complete fidelity. And it was a system that they were completely unprepared to build. The advantage in our case was since we had spent a whole bunch of time with our customers who all said, listen, by the way, 90% of my volume is a cash on delivery. You need to figure out how to get this cash back to me. We started out by saying, let's build a payment gateway on top of our services right at the start. That was problem number two with our existing, with, our, with the existing players of the competitors. And problem number three that came out was the sheer industrial engineering of the networks themselves. 
Logistics networks are engineered a certain way. If you build, uh, if you've done stats 101, they're giant transportation problems, which converge to fairly simple solutions. Typically, the larger a logistics company and the greater the diversity of products it handles, the more it moves towards a hub and spoke sort of model. The challenge with the hub and spoke model, if you remember Stacks 101, is basically the number of times you have to touch a parcel as it moves through the network. Because by definition, you're trying to move it through a specific set of aggregation points. The trouble with that model in e-commerce is that that model necessarily slows you down and increases the cost at which you operate. The problem is that in e-commerce, you're essentially people like us are B2B businesses who sell services to companies who can't afford them. Right? I'm sure you're aware of how much e-commerce companies bleed money for the first 15 years that they operate, if they ever make money at all, 15 years later. And so our, one of the major challenges we had to recognize was that we operate in an environment where our customers are dramatically cost sensitive as well. So fundamentally, three things. Our customers are tremendously cost sensitive. They're, their customers are extremely sensitive to time. And on top of that, we need to build a payment gateway on top of our basic transportation and uh, warehousing service. So that's the context in which we decided to start delivery five years ago and say this is a B2B problem, common to the entire industry. This is what the existing players can't solve, which delivery can solve. This is how we'll co-develop the product with the customers that we have, right? So that's how we started the business five years ago. Um, and I've given you a good sense of where we are today. I'm going to pause here before I actually sort of get into any more detail and start by asking you if you have any questions about what I've said so far. Fundamentally, there are three metrics that we use, which are also basically the metrics that our customers track us on. The first one is the precision of the service which is if we say that we will deliver a product to you in X amount of time, what percentage of the time do we meet that service guarantee? So if we tell you that we'll deliver a product from Delhi to Bombay in 24 hours, we have to be there 99% of the time. And then we measure that across every lane across the entire network. The second one that we measure is our efficiency, which is what is the cost per unit that it costs us for us to deliver that product. And therefore that translates into the price that we charge to our customers. So we started out, for instance, strategically, we started out with a very simple roadmap saying we have to be the cheapest player in the space. Over the next 10 years, we have to build a model that becomes materially cheaper than anything that a competitor could develop. So today, as an example, we're about, our cost structure is about 70% lower than any of our competitors in this space. It just come out of specific design choices in the network. So that's the second metric that, that we track. And the third one that we track on top of service quality at cost is to break up the cost and say to not just be the most efficient or the most cost efficient as a whole, but to unbundle the service and to say, am I the most cost efficient on each part of the service? Now, what I mean by that is when, when you pick up, when you're delivering an order, there are three legs to it from a transportation standpoint. One is where you pick up the order. The second is the middle mile. And then there's the last mile, which is the distribution center. So we say not only do we have to be lowest cost across all three, we also have to be the lowest cost on each of these individually. Right? The reason that is a strategic call because then the logic is you cannot be unbundled. If you're the cheapest player in the space on all of the individual parts as well as the sum, actually nobody can compete with you on even one single element of the service. And then you can actually open out each of those three. So that's, those are the three core metrics that we sort of track. And then there's a whole bunch of auxiliary metrics that we track as well. Return rates, cash handling time, amount of cash handled, fidelity of the cash service. All of those are tracked separately. So these are the three major metrics that you would look at, the major management metrics. There's only one way to do it, which again comes back to the partnership question. We started out for the first four years by owning every part of our transportation network. So essentially, every person who came and delivered a product to you was trained and was a delivery employee. What we've done over the last year is to bring close to about 2,400 partners into our network who bring flexible capacity. So essentially what we're doing is we go to local retailers. So we have 2,200 local retail partners. So as an example, Rambhai could be a partner for us, where we just go off and give him 20 parcels and say, you know, hand these off to the students in the campus when they get here, right? Or similarly, the grocer under an apartment complex is a delivery extension. He's what we call an alternate delivery partner. Right? Now, there are two kinds. One is where they augment capacity in the locations that we're already present in. Right? So let's say in Delhi, we have the ability to deliver, call it 30,000 orders a day. 
right? These guys add a flex capacity of another five, 6,000 orders a day, which allows us to stretch. The second kind of partner is where we opened up our backend transport management system, simplified it, and started providing it as a service to other courier com companies. Now, those courier companies, which what we call constellation partners, right? Because the idea is just like a constellation of courier companies all over the country. They extend our reach in locations that we don't service directly. So to give you an example, in, um, in most of Bihar, in the smaller towns, delivery doesn't go direct. We manage the middle mile all the way up to the city. So let's say you're going to Ara or to Katira or to Sasaram or somewhere like that. We would drive into the city, hand off the shipments to a third party partner, and that partner would then deliver at the last mile. So there are two kinds of partners that we build over there who give us flex. One of them is the constellation partner, one of them is the, is the retail delivery partner. But they allow us to stretch up and down. See, the ultimate entry barrier in, the, there are two things. If you're looking to build a long-term, low-cost lead, you, two, there are only two ways that businesses succeed in the very long run. One is either they're the lowest cost player in their space, or the other alternative is they build a product that people want to buy. Whereas you're either Apple or Amazon. And there's literally nothing in between. All businesses converge to one of these two models in the long run. We've chosen the second path, right? So the long-term competitive advantage for a business which wants to win in the low-cost space is to just be the most efficient by far. Your cost structure itself is a competitive advantage. See, it's impossible today for somebody to come back in and replicate our cost structure without spending twice the amount of money that we did and to still take two years to do it. So we'll still be ahead. All competitive advantages over a very long run can be purchased. The point is that it's a very big barrier and nobody wants to get into the space. See, to replicate us, you would have to sink in close to about $120 million in CapEx to start with. And then wait for the network to catch up over the next two or three years. You'd have to train five years worth of employees, you know, 15,000 people across 500 cities. That's a very big competitive advantage. And ultimately, it's in the engineering, the technology, the way the, product, the system interacts with itself that we have our competitive advantages. There's really one major reason to build a successful partnership, especially in the B2B environment. It's, uh, you, you have to show that person the money. It has to work. There has to be an economic value that gets created for your partner, which is why the person comes and works with you. What we did was to go to all of these retail outlets and say, listen, you're a grocer. Aap is building a delivery kar rahe ho, right? You're going and delivering grocery to my house or to somebody else's house. You have a Chotu who's doing this. What if I could add another 3,000 rupees to that guy's earnings? You take another 30 parcels for me, go to the same houses that you deliver grocery in, and go and deliver it, and I'll pay you 15 rupees per parcel every day. 50 parcels, karo. that's 750 rupees a day. Over a month, you end up making, you know, whatever, 20,000 rupees um, if you're a partner. So all the partners were basically brought in on purely on the economic logic. We made sure to tell them that you have no incremental investment. Aapka grocery store hai, aapka already store hai. You already have the guy who's delivering the product. All I'm doing is giving you another 30 parcels. And this I'm giving you a smartphone. This smartphone pe aapko ko batana hai ki, when did you deliver the order? That's it. The investment is mine. Once you pitch it that way, there's nobody who will come and say, ki, I don't want to do this. So it was pretty easy for us to scale up the partnerships. From a product standpoint, or from a value proposition standpoint, there's no difference to how you build a B2B business or a B2C business or a consumer to consumer business or any, all business has a very basic set of rules. You have a set of customers who express a need and are willing to pay a price for that need to be fulfilled. And as a company, you've got to figure out how you meet that need, whether it's producing a pair of shoes, you know, figuring out how to give them a menu from which they can order or whether you provide a transportation service. At a certain level of abstraction, it makes no difference. The only difference between consumers and, and businesses is that businesses typically have, typically, and to start with at the surface, have a better articulated set of needs than consumers do. Business as delivery, for instance, I understand the pain points of our business completely. Like for instance, payroll is a big headache for us. So it's pretty easy for a company which wants to do payroll management to come to us and say, I know exactly how to manage payroll for 15,000 employees, come and service to us. What we did was to get our customers and to get them to co-develop with us. B2C companies typically don't start that way. They start with an idea, right? Uber starts because Travis Kalanick and his friends have a night out on town and then they can't find a cab back and Travis thinks what a great idea it is if I have an app which can get me a car. 
right? Zomato starts because the guys there think we can't order food. It's a great idea if I could find every restaurant. So in that sense, they think of themselves as consumers and then build the product out from there. Right? In a B2B environment, the advantage is you can go and talk to 10 potential customers and say, all right, what's your problem? What's your problem? What's yours? Each of them then expresses a relatively similar sort of need. And then you have the ability to combine all of those into the minimum viable product. So that, for instance, when we started, we discovered there were three elements in the value proposition that mattered to everybody. Speed, which is how fast will you deliver to my customer. Second was visibility. Can I see exactly where every order is? Can my customer see exactly where every order is? And the third on top of that was, can you handle my cash very well? So we started out with a simple three-pronged value proposition, which was common to every single one of our customers. It's not to say they didn't have other unexpressed needs. They did. But this was the basic, minimum, common sort of set of needs that they articulated, which is where B2B and B2C become slightly different. You can use your customers as, as reliable partners. You can't use your customers as very reliable partners in a B2C environment because there's too much noise in the data. And if you go back eight years when Meru Cabs was large and you went to every single customer in the country and said, well, you know, how should I think of designing a cab service? Nobody would have come with Uber, right? Whereas in the B2B environment, what you can do is to sort of start with the minimum viable product, get it going, enter your customer. And then as you sort of understand more about the challenges they face in more detail, then you build on add-on services. So we started warehousing two years after we started transportation. A year and a half after that, we started LTL. So what happens is your customer's business starts influencing this, the growth and scale of your business. It starts influencing the product decisions you take. B2C also, after a while, starts becoming similar, but you also have to make larger leaps of faith in some ways. You think of yourself as a customer and then start. That's the major difference between B2B and, and B2C. But otherwise, the only other difference is the sales cycles. Right? B2C is more about marketing. B2B is more about sales in some ways. Right? So you have to build a brand in a B2C business, whereas in a B2B business, it's a question of getting the service right again and again and again and again and again and again. And then you have a sales cycle. So you say, I'll go and meet you know, 10,000 potential customers. I'll convert 50% you know, of them into good leads. 10% of them will then start working with me. And they have a typically a longer sales cycle, depending on the service itself. So, well, the first one was we realized that we needed to increase the speed of cash processing. So to give you a sense, when we started the business, our competitors used to take 30 days to return cash to the shipper, which meant if you were a COD-run e-commerce business, you would first of all acquire stock for which you would pay, typically at that point if you were a small e-commerce company in advance. Then it would take you 30 to 45 days to liquidate the stock, then seven days of shipping, then 30 days of cash back. Right, so you're taking nearly, your working capital cycle was two and a half months. So we said, look, we can't influence the first part. We can certainly influence the other two. So drop the seven day shipping to one day and drop the 30 day reconciliation cycle to two days. Right, why we picked two days was we said, in the long run, for this to be a neutral service to payment gateway, an online payment gateway, you have to match the online payment gateway in terms of both cost and speed. An online gateway will typically take 48 to 72 hours to return capital to your business. We said we have to design offline the same way. What we did was to make sure when orders were being delivered, they were all being electronically tracked. It was step one. It sounds like it was the easiest thing to do. It was not very hard to do um, for us, but it is hard to do across an entire network. So it was, it's, you know, that's why the existing guys weren't able to do it as well. So our guys had smartphones. Every time they actually went out and delivered an order, they would mark it. We knew at our back end, and we would already start the payment gateway calculations, which is we've received the COD, what percentage of that is ours, what percentage of that goes back to the e-commerce company, all of that was getting tracked in real time. Then we basically started building the systems which would expose that information in real time back to the e-commerce company. Right? So essentially we built the database first, we built our own calculations on top of that. Then we started giving that back to them via APIs, saying integrating into their finance systems, saying this is the cash that's due to you from delivery. And then it was a very simple process, it was an operational process. The cash comes into the branch, you go to a bank branch, deposit it in the currency chest. That's there in your account at the end of day. You reconcile it the next day in the morning and ship it back, you know, transfer the cash electronically to your customers. So it became a seamless process. What we did learn, the only interesting thing we learned, two things. One is when we started, both are operational. One is when we started, um, we used to reconcile only cash. And we used to be worried about the fact that somebody might run away with the capital uh, we discovered that almost never happens. Uh, people never run away with your cash. What they do is they run away with your inventory. 
So <laughs> we discovered that you could not do just a cash audit. You had to do a cash plus inventory audit. So what we did very quickly after the first couple of phones went missing was to institute every day across every one of our branches a complete inventory cycle plus cash audit. So our branches have to close both, which means either they have the cash or they scan the airway bill, which is the unique tracking ID. If both of those don't happen, you know something is wrong. Because let's say he says, well, yes, I, I have the cash, but I forgot to scan three waybills. Chances are he's delivered those, taken the cash himself, and said that the, you know, these three waybills aren't there. Right? So those kinds of things we discovered later. The second thing we discovered was the time cycle with which you, you manage the cash. So we discovered that what guys would do is, and this is actually quite interesting, it, it, we would tell them, Ki, achha, theke, you collected you know, one lakh yesterday in this branch. And it was 8 p.m. by the time you got the cash, so you couldn't go and deposit it in the bank. You're depositing it tomorrow. What this guy would very neatly do in the beginning was in the morning quickly send out three, four riders. They would go and deliver, let's say, another 15,000 rupees worth. Take that, take 15,000 and put it in his pocket out of the previous day's one lakh. Add this 15,000 into that and deposit the one lakh. So he was rolling the cash. As long as the guy did it where it was a very small percentage of the total, it was difficult to catch. Eventually, they all used to get caught because what they would do is get ambitious with this program. And then they would get caught. It used to start off by saying, let me steal 5,000 out of 10 lakhs. Then it used to become, the guy gets used to it. He says, Chalo, tomorrow 10,000, then 15, then 20. Again, what we started doing to stop rolling was most of those branches, we essentially did two things. One is we got CMS. So we got the banks to collect from our uh, centers at 9 in the morning and 8 in the night. So it became impossible for our guys to roll the cash the guys who wanted to, they realized that this is impossible. And in all of the other locations, what we started doing was wherever our branch was very far away from a bank branch, we trained our algos. So what we do is every one of our banking partners, Kotak, ICICI, all these guys, provide us a real-time stream of each one of their banking locations, the GPS coordinates of each of them, opening and closing hours, all of that. That gets fed into our routing algos which actually designed the whole network. So when we are placing a distribution center, deciding where to start one, one of the factors it chooses is distance from the nearest banking partner. So typically, if you go to a delivery branch, we are in the same complex as a bank branch, or we are right across it from the road. The happy positive externality of that is we also spend less on security, because we realize that the bank has security of its own, and we just piggyback on their security guard. So that's, it's more operational than it is anything else. That's a great question. That's actually what we did was for the first 18 months. Uh, it's very interesting. So when we started delivery, if you go back to the news articles from 2011, five other companies started with us three months later. So there was a company called Chotu.com. There was one called India on Time. There was one called India Express or something and two others. Um, very simply put, we did not have the capital to go pan India. We had only our savings and we'd already, like I said, blown 40% of that on vehicles that we didn't need. Um, we decided that we would understand the unit of our business perfectly. And we realized that the unit of our business was one distribution center. You know, if we could get one distribution center perfect and make it operate exactly the way we wanted at full efficiency with full service quality, then it was simply a question of taking whatever you learned with that one unit and just doing it a million times and getting it right. So we actually started our first city. We, were in, we started our first DC in Gurgaon in June of 2011. We started our next DC in April the following year. So it took us nearly 12 months to actually set up our next DC because we just kept doing it in Gurgaon day after day after day after day after day. So we, would, we started out in June by doing 35 orders per day, if I remember, on the first day in our Gurgaon DC. Nearly 12 months later, um, we were doing only 300 odd orders a day. But we said, we're going to keep perfecting this. Now, the advantage that that's, that's helped us with in the long run is our first DC took us 12 months to build. Our second DC took us two months to build. You know, today, DC takes us anywhere from 24 to 48 hours to build. So we're much faster. So as a company, last year, I'll give you an example. We, we went, at the same time last year, we were in 3,200 pin codes. This year, same time, 6,800. By December end, we'll be in 8,500. What that does, our competitors are simply unable to understand how we're expanding at this speed. Because the only reason we can do it is because that DC is fully codified. We know exactly what to do. To the point where I know, Kiar, 
where is the table going to be? Where is the switchboard? You know, what power backup do I need? It's codified down to that level. To who is the guy, where will he sit, how will he operate, when will the cache come in, what are the localities around it, how many riders, which routes, all of that is system driven now. So we actually started very small, stayed very small for a very long time. And our market share numbers show that. Two years back at this time, we were 8% of the market. Last year, we were 14.5% of the market. This year, we're 22% of the market. Right? That's coming from the fact that we stayed very small for the first two, three years. I genuinely think that's the right approach, always. Cool.